Good day, good night. CFR Network, CFR News, CFR Sports. As you already know, diligently working hard in the lab. Trust everybody is well. We made it through the zombie apocalypse part one. We're here for part two. <laughs> And I've got a special guest with me, Jeffrey Wilson. Welcome to the broadcast. If you can give a brief introduction to yourself, sir. Well, yeah, returning guest here. I appreciate you having me on once again. I am Jeffrey Wilson from That Podcast Network. And there you can find a variety of our shows, The Conspiracy Farm. It's me speaking to you, Everything Combat. Uh, we are growing the network. Uh, we have several shows we're going to be signing up here very soon. Um, just out here in good old the sticks of Iowa, looking at the uh, Scott County Park, checking out all this snow that just fell after it was 70 degrees a couple days ago. And uh, just looking forward to chopping it up with you, my friend. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and it, it's an honor again. It's always wonderful speaking to yourself. Um, wealth of experience um, and wealth of knowledge in so many different areas. So it's always good chopping it up with, um, as you say, with, with like minds. Um, you know, um, giving something uh, interesting for the uh, the listeners to partake on their journeys or whilst they're washing up cooking, whatever it may be. Absolutely. That's so where, where I, I tell you where we should start. I think we should start with some of some good news in regards to yourself. Like what's going on with you, with you since the last time we've spoken, sir? Well, like anything in life, like we talked about a little bit off air is a balance, man. Some things are going great. Some things are going not so great. But I think that is just kind of the plight of life. You know, we all have to balance the things that are going good and, not, and going not so good. But over the last, you know, over the last year, it's been really crazy. Obviously, you know, the normal jobs that I do were kind of taken away due yes. to COVID. And I was already I already had other stakes in the fire, but it was very, very uh, urgent that I definitely keep those stakes going and burning brightly, whether it was the podcast, whether it was the acting, whether it was the voiceover, but in any of that, you just never know kind of where that next check's going to come. So you got to definitely keep grinding, keep the stakes in the fire. But uh, yeah, 2021 is starting off pretty sweet, man. We ended 2020. Um, I commentate and I co-own a company. It's called Everything Combat LS LLC, as well as it being a podcast where we work with a company called Cage Aggression, where we air their fights on pay-per-view. Um, it's been awesome, been an awesome ride. I commentate the fights with UFC Hall of Famer Pat Militich, UFC legend and future Hall of Famer Lil Evil Dent Pulver. Yes, indeed. Both of, them, both of them the very first champions in their weight division. Mm -hmm. So we had three back-to-back -back events of September, October, November of last year, and we just were killing it. And this here at the end of March 25th, 26th, 27th is going to be the first ever in the sport of MMA, a three-night MMA pay-per-view event right here in my hometown of Davenport, Iowa at the River Center. If you guys have any interest or aren't doing anything that weekend, cagedaggression.tv, jam-packed stack card, LFA veterans, Bell Bellator veterans, UFC veterans. So, you know, like I said, just try to have as many stakes in the fire as possible, my friend. And I'm a grandpa now. <laughs> Whoa, congratulations, congratulations. Um, I appreciate that. Boy or a girl? It is a boy, young Emmett. He's amazing. Excellent. In, in in these tumultuous times, obviously babies are still being born. Let's not forget that. Well, and I told my daughter, it was, I mean, I'm seeing almost every other day on my Facebook timeline or my social network, people posting pictures of their newborn babies. It's almost like the baby boomers at World War II. It's like, now we're going to be calling these, these COVID babies. Yeah. Everybody got, locked, everybody got locked in and got a little friendly with each other, which is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful yes. thing. Yes. And it, it does show, and as you've highlighted, that's exactly what they're being called, COVID babies. You know, it, people have been yeah. locked together. For some, it's been very terrible. But for yeah. others, it's been an, an like a an awakening, a, a reconnection to, you know, your, your spiritual other. Yes. And, you know, what we're here to do is to procreate and bring forth light and well, life. It, it almost illustrates what I was saying in the beginning. You know what I mean? Like, you're exactly right, man. Emergency room visits of kids being abused, domestic violence, drunkenness, overdoses, mm. people beating their babies. So there is a yin and there's a yang, like anything in life. And so there's always that balance. So it is beautiful to see people who took that time and did something productive but again you can't have the one side without the other so i mean it's uh again it's very crazy times we're in man most definitely and i did notice i have been uh, obviously i do keep a, a diligent eye on the old social media and stuff um those three events that you did last year those were wrestling events right uh mma mma uh, mma for some strange reason i had wrestling in my head is it the well, I, that, probably because of our last conversation i'm a huge wrestling head 
So I've I've called I've called some wrestling too, but no, these events, Cage Aggression MMA, it is straight amateur and pro mixed martial arts. Like I said, veterans from LFA, UFC, Bellator. Like I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. These kids are these kids are there to scrap. <laughs> Give it their all. This that is it. Okay, so. Give us a, a little bit of a, of a taste of, of those events. Was, well, it a mixture I mean, of, was it a mixture of amateur and pro on, or across all yeah, of these? It was, it was, absolutely, absolutely. And again, these guys, I mean, the amateurs, obviously they're amateurs, so they haven't had the chance to fight in like your LFA, your Bellator, your UFCs. But these guys who have come to the UFC, come to Cage Aggression from those promotions, Mm-hmm. or have gone on to those promotions from cage aggression these guys are the guys and girls i mean we have people fighting you know uh eileen villa lobos several people have come from uh, jackson winklejohn which uh-huh. is a huge gym here in albuquerque new mexico where john jones fights out of holly holm fights yeah. out of both jo- holly former champion john jones obviously a well, former lightweight champion but he gave it up to fight heavyweight so the, i mean these kids are coming in super super talented super hungry ready to fight it is such a huge it has grown Mike Goodwin and Cage Aggression have grown this over 10 years and not necessarily to pat ourselves on the back because it all it, we're, we're all kind of a family helping each other. But mm-hmm. with our addition of like Pat Militich, Jens Pulver, the pay-per-view platform that we developed, it's helped take the whole thing to a next level. Mike Goodwin, the CEO, he's he's having to turn down fighters in the hundreds now who wow. are willing to pay their own way to come fight on this platform because not only is it one of the largest growing uh, platform or promotions in the Midwest, again, you got two UFC legends calling your fights it's being seen all over on pay-per-view. So it's definitely a platform and a place where people are, are definitely clamoring to come to fight on. Good to hear. Good to hear. And it's good that we've got um, a, a plethora of other promotions and organizations that people can cut their teeth on. Um, most people just think, you know, the, the quote-unquote casuals, oh, UFC. And they think yeah. and they associate that with absolutely everything rather than, you know, that that's just a promotion, sir. <laughs> there were a plethora of other major promotions. Um, what's the presence like on YouTube for caged aggression? Are there, is there much highlights? Like what, what's, is the subscribership absolutely. growing on that? Absolutely. We have uh, cage, cage aggression MMA on YouTube. Um, we have full, full events, the full three hour events, but lately we've been chopping them up into individual fights. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you were to fight on there, it could be like, you don't have to just tease through the whole card. You could specifically find where your fight was. And again, <clears throat> the matchups have been incredible and the knockouts have been, um, I think our, our October, September, October event, it was a spinning heel cook, spinning heel kick to this gentleman by the name of Michael Ship. He's a game fighter. So he has nothing to be, you know, unhappy about except for catching that L that night. But it was such an incredible knockout. Jens Paul was sitting next to me. He's like, oh, shit. So that made national news. That made Business Insider Apple news. And then another one of our last fights, uh, uh, Brendan Jenkins and Jordan Henchman, Jordan the Henchman Hinman, who will be joining us in the broadcast booth this time. Jordan suffered, you know, he was winning the fight. But out of nowhere, Brandon spun off this spinning elbow, which literally – Everyone in the crowd just knew it was bad. Even Pat Millich had stood up immediately and was like, that's bad, that's bad. Mm. It, 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 made, it made Jordan's face, as he said, into cornflakes. So he wound up getting like 60 screws in his face. Whoa. And so his, his future in the MMA ranks is, is in doubt, but he's a veteran of the cage aggression cage, and he's going to be joining us on the broadcasting team Saturday night. Pat's going to be joining me Friday. I'm sorry, Thursday, Pat's going to be joining me. Jen's Thursday. And then Jordan's going to be calling the fights with me on Saturday. I'll be doing all three nights. I'm the workhorse out here. but Definitely, definitely. So I take awesome. it, but based upon previous fighters, injuries, et cetera, and just the psychology of, you know, uh, these warriors and athletes who, who go out to do uh, these combat sports, is, is he thinking currently of um, staying in, uh, well, t- returning to fighting? Or is he looking at transitioning into uh, presenting? I think I think he the, the latter. I mean, he's I think 35, 36 years old. He's had a very illustrious career. He's fought, I believe, in LFA and other the bigger promotions too. It it was really really a catastrophic injury, and you know he he didn't lose consciousness, but you know his his face, you know it it really cracked his face up pretty bad. So the nature of MMA obviously is being hit and being hit in the face, and he does have 60 screws in there and titanium and this and that. But, you know, he just had a new baby girl a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, we, we had a very interesting discussion. If you go to Cage Aggression MMA or Everything Combat, you could see the episode where we talked to the CEO, Mike Goodwin, 
talk to Jordan about his injuries, his medical costs, et cetera. And Jen's pulver actually broke down the fight with him and Brandon and, you know, tell him what was going right, what was going wrong. And again, Brandon just spun that elbow out of nowhere. But um, he, he's, he's definitely reconsidering his path. And, you know, he's called cage aggression fights before. And he's a very, very smart, articulate, well-spoken guy. And he's been in the sport for a very long time. So he definitely, as a color commentator, knows knows what he's talking about, knows what to look for as he's calling fights, without a doubt. Excellent. I mean, it's it's similar to of sorts. I mean, I, I don't know how uh, damaged Mr. Sage, Super Sage Northcott, who's, who um, lost very his... Very similar. Very, yeah. very big injury. Very, very big frontal face injury. And yeah, there was a lot of question about whether he should return as well, because that was... Even though that did not look like it, it, it was a huge shot, but mm. the damage that was done with that one single shot was was devastating to Sage. Most definitely, but he's he's making his return, I think, in um for the Quite TNT. Possibly. Yes, he's had he's had some time. He's had some time, but again, it's just one of those you just, you know, like Bruce Lee called it, the art of fighting without fighting. The whole point is to hit and not get hit. And you know, mm. we've seen plenty of incredible defensive counterpunching people who very rarely get hit. But yes. there's always that. You know, almost Sage didn't see that coming. My boy Jordan Hinman didn't see that spinning elbow coming. Michael Schiff didn't see that spinning heel kick coming. So, I mean, there's, again, the, the, the competition is is very much so on an, on some next level stuff. So these guys have to be on point every time they step into that cage. And that's the that's the wonders. And the, the thing about um, combat sports, especially mixed martial arts, is that anything can happen. You can have a yeah. 500, 500 to one, or however these buck these these um odds are favorites. <laughs> and yeah. all it takes is a stick submission, or a, you know, a heel, a spinning heel kick, a elbow. And I mean, that's I always it. liken it. I always like it to to like uh, Buster Douglas, who completely shocked the world. Mm. You know, in the late '80s, knocking out Mike Tyson. Like Tyson. there was absolutely mm. no shot of him winning. And he went in there and freaking knocked him out after getting up from almost being knocked out. So yeah, it's it's one of those like 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 NFL. It's an any given this particular night. It's usually Saturday, but it's it's an any given night type sport where anything mm. can happen. Most definitely, most definitely. And I'd be remiss if I don't um, talking about injuries and stuff. And, and now you've mentioned boxing. Um, we, we lost a a veteran. Was it yes uh, yesterday or the day before? Was it? A few days ago, Marvin Hagler. Absolutely. Yes indeed yeah. a shining light when boxing was great the golden era of boxing for some they may have a different era but for me the 80s and yeah. 90s that, yeah, that exactly. was just the time and that the the fights that he had the classic fights that he had was just out well, well. And everyone started posting and i you know um the the legendary fight of him and uh and, hearns hearns and Hagler, time yes. and hearns those three rounds you know it was just so iconic I mean, that was that embodied that spirit, like you said, in the 80s, you know, you had Hearns, you had Hagler, you had uh, Roberto Duran, Sugar Ooh. Ray Leonard. I mean, that's just one weight class. I mean, mm. the 80s of boxing, that's really when I started really enjoying combat sports as a kid, watching boxing on like Wild World of Sports with Howard Cosell. And yeah, the 80s. I mean, I know it's it's there's still some very talented fighters out there, but I know. The, the ranks were so, there was so much depth in each weight class. Definitely, definitely. And I don't, well, maybe because we're not, we were, we were too young maybe to be privy to it, but it didn't seem like there was too much boxing politics. It was a case of this person, you know, is good. That person's good. They've beat so many people. Let's put them together and fight kind of thing. There was yeah. always pretty much big fights going on. Well, and you know, you can't talk about 80s boxing without Don King, so... <laughs> There's always some measure of politics in the mix if you start talking about Don King, but the, the matchups were pretty on point. There wasn't, there wasn't too much of the jumping of the ranks where people completely undeserved would get a title shot or whatever. Cause I mean, back in the day, I mean, people, and even kind of now with the UFC, people demand certain fights and you know, it's all about putting ass in the seats and sell those pay-per-views. You can't be putting glass Joe in there with, yes. you know, Anthony Joshua or Tyson Fury, you know, no one wants to see that. So they go for what the fighter, the fans want to see most times. Well, but yeah, most times with a big, big exclamation mark on either side. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've, you've highlighted it perfectly. It's, it's now, I mean, it was sports entertainment before, but it's, it's even more leaning towards, I would even flip those two around and say entertainment sports especially when we talk about modern day boxing and UFC it's yeah without a doubt and that's why as a, as an old school professional wrestling fan 
I love that aspect of it. My partner, my homeboy, huh? you know, my broadcast partner, like Pat Militich, he hated huh? that stuff. He always, don't be it gloating does. in the ring, just get in the ring and fight. And it was always like, you know, but that's, you know, and then Conor McGregor comes along and I kind of gate called it, you know, the Conor McGregor effect, or even like a Shale Sonnen. He loses to Anderson Silva and then talks his way into a light heavyweight fight with John Jones, which, you know, he still lost, but it, it started, it started illustrating you can talk your way into big, big fights. And I kind of like that aspect of the professional wrestling kind of aspect of it. Yeah. But not with not without, not at the, not at the expense of the rankings, like we were talking about, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Shale Sonnen in no way, shape or form deserved that light heavyweight fight. I don't think he even, even fought in light heavy. His other, his previous fight was a middleweight against Anderson Silva, but he, he did, he talked his way into a situation where the fans wanted to see that. And Dana White, intelligent as he as he is as a matchmaker was like you know what people want to see this let's it's, sell it out and i'm yeah. sure they did yeah well, most definitely most definitely and he's he's the the king the uh the, the foundation of of smack talking quote unquote and and the promo was within uh, mixed martial arts absolutely and i mean that's why he did you know fighting mayweather are you kidding me <laughs> but he did it <laughs> you know he parlayed it and that's i mean that's without and, and that's the sad part about it you know success leaves clues and I've seen other fighters, and I won't mention any names, try to replicate that effect, but it's not organic. That is organic to Conor McGregor, talking yeah. smack and going in and backing it up. So you have people who, like, you know, most fighters, like, oh, my God, this dude's making heavy dollars. Granted, he's, he's putting his money where his mouth is, but his mouth is running and upping his dollars. So you had a lot of fighters trying to replicate that in a very inorganic, not natural fashion, and people saw right through it. Everyone started calling for super fights. <laughs> I'm the best in the world, and I'm in a super fight, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> And it just didn't it, it just didn't play because it was it was more manufactured than organic. Definitely. And the, the uh, McGregor effect had and I'll, I'll emphasize had its time when he burst yes. onto the scene and he was calling the, the rounds when he was going to, you know, do the thing. <laughs> Mystic it was, Mac, baby. Mystic, Mystic Mac. Mac. Exactly. He, it was he was in the minds, <clears throat> excuse me, he was in the minds of the fighter. They, they were pretty much defeated by, you know, before they even entered the cage or the octagon. Exactly. And that, a perfect example is Jose Aldo. Oh, Jose gosh. Aldo was one of the pound for pound best in the world. Yes. And he let Connor mind F him like nobody's business. Totally, totally. And it, you know, it does, it does happen. I mean, lot, not a lot of fighters necessarily fall for it, but it's, it, that 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 effect, man. It, Mike Tyson used to do it. He said in his documentary, like a lot of these guys were done before the bell even rang, mm. just because I was so in their head. I didn't even have to really say anything. Just the <laughs> just the specter of Mike Tyson yes. was enough for them to be like, "Damn, do I really do I want this smoke? I don't think I want this I smoke. Don't. This is Mike Tyson here. This is just the money, man. I, I might be able to get a lucky punch in here and there, but he's just gonna he's gonna annihilate me, and I am Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and even Mike, you know, talking about he would he would he had. He, he was very fearful walking to the ring. He was very fearful. He dreamed about his opponent beating him, et cetera. And like he says, he stepped into the cage. He was a conqueror. He was Alexander. He was under, you know, he, there's nobody that could hurt him. But, you know, it's, I think fear is a part of it. But, you know, like life, it's just how you, how you deal with it, how you react to fear. Most definitely. And, and I think working um, or training within a, um, a, a sport especially a combat sport i think that does does tremendous things for the um for, for the confidence for your thinking process decision making processing um yeah. the, uh, the whole package really well and i i interviewed ed suarez who was anderson silva's manager and also is the ceo of legacy fighting alliance and i was asking him about the night he got knocked out by Chris Weidman, I'm like, why would he put himself in such a vulnerable situation? I don't, not to go back too far on the fight, but you know, normally your fighting stance is one foot, one foot ahead, one foot back. Mm -hmm. He was literally standing with both feet perpendicular to each other, yes. and he kind of was clowning, and Chris yeah. caught him. Yeah. And then, you know, and Ed was like, "Listen, man, it was stupid to have done that." He, did, I'm paraphrasing. He didn't say it was stupid, but he was destroying everyone. He was the best in the world at what he did, and everyone kept coming up to him, coming up to him telling him how awesome he was, and yeah. he knew that because he was the one doing it. Yes. So it creates almost like Mike Tyson in Japan before he fought Buster Douglas. He wasn't – he was partying. He was mm. hanging out with hookers and this and that. You get this certain level of complacency, and you believe your own – not that it's BS because, like I said, Anderson was showing and proving. It's hype. it's hype and you start you start believing your own <laughs> hype and there's always i don't care who you are whether you're in a cage or whatever there's always someone out there tougher than you 
who's prepared. Like as you're sitting there, like like Connor. I don't think Connor's ever necessarily going to be the same who he was when he first came in. He's he just sold his half of his stake in proper twelve, 12 for almost yeah. whatever it was, three hundred million or whatever it yeah. was. He he's not wanting anymore for any of that stuff. So that that, in my opinion, as a fighter, and not as I've never fought, but I I can only imagine that reduces your desire to go out there and get punched in the face when you can <sighs> just you know. You literally do not need to work again. Your family, your, you know, your progeny, you, you've created generational wealth. So I think that diminishes a hunger to some degree. I could be wrong, but just even looking at his last fight, it's hard to super quantify that because I think that was a combination of ring rust and Dustin Poirier has been on a tear yes. while, while connor has been out not fighting. And I think there is a certain level of ring rust to some degree because, you know, connor has been to the mountaintop and then some. A lot of these guys like Dustin, they're still waiting to get there, fighting to get there. I think, it takes, I think it diminishes the fire a little bit. Hundred percent, I would hundred percent agree with that. I think there was a boxer who said something about sleeping in. He doesn't sleep in silk sheets or something like that. And and who no, that, that was? It? That was Marvin Hagler. That was oh. Marvin Hagler. He said it's hard for me to get up and run at five a.m. when I'm getting up, getting out of silk sheets. Yes, yeah, I'm challenging that's him. The, that, that's the discipline, though. Like if you if you see, it's called HBO Legendary Night. It was a great series on HBO from some of the most iconic fights in the game and one of them was uh hearns and Hagler. and hearns when he would or Hagler when he would train he would call it going to jail yes. he would go to a spot where he wouldn't no women no drink no nothing but it, it's having that discipline even though when your belly's full the bank account's full mm -hmm. to still get up and put that work in man it's it's a testament to these guys man definitely that the mental fortitude people have you know as you say if you're a millionaire no you'd say you're, you're a thousandaire and you've come from absolutely nothing and you know you're doing yeah, something yeah. you enjoy your prize fighting and then you've you've bought your mom a house you've bought yourself a house you've brought your siblings maybe a house or helped them to get a house everyone's got cars you know you've been on the vacations it's yeah. you know you're, you're you're at a point where you've you've pretty much got everything so what are you fighting for now are you fighting for for money or is it for the love and the passion of it and as you say once you've got so much and in connor's case specifically if he was more active and whether this is um all down to dana white or not but after his that huge layoff he had and he he, he demolished cowboy in that very quick time yeah he was saying look i want to be fighting two to two times or three times that year and we didn't hear nothing. <laughs> and it well, wasn't again, until... He, I know he has his own personal stuff going on, which, I mean, none of this self lends it, none of this lends itself to staying on top of your game. Like, he's a multimillionaire now. I know he's had his own personal legal problems, mm -hmm. and he hasn't been as active, and the sport is changing day to day. These yes. fighters are so freaking incredible and incredibly trained. You can't dip out for a couple years, a year yeah. and a half, two years, I mean, with Conor, he gets obviously special dispensations and he gets, you know, he's at the top of the ranks. But anybody who's starting from the bottom, I mean, those guys are freaking, you know, it, like they call it a murderer's row. Your top 10 mm. in any division is a murderer's row of cats who are just waiting to take your head off. And you, you there's no, again, that hunger, I don't think is just there for him. So the, the, you can't be complacent in any time during the UFC, but especially now, these people are coming in, they're assassins, man. Of course, and it's a, it's a young man's sport. It is a total young man's sport. And one of the comments he said is, oh, the, you know, those car, there was calf kicks. Oh, I wasn't, you know, those really yeah. affected me. But come on, we've been knowing about calf kicks now for, for a couple of years now, how effective they've been. You know, when um, Henry Cejudo lost, you know, rolled his, his, his you know, his, his foot out on the fight, was it with um, DJ? Demetrius um... Johnson? The it first it time. possibly was. I think yeah. it possibly was. Um, and also with um, the guy who's just come from Bellator, Chandler, Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler, yeah, is now St. Louis native, uh, is he, now in the UFC. PCC. And that's what that's what Jens was talking about in the breakdown of, of the fight and just in general about how the calf kicks are being used. We, we've seen leg kicks mm. that hit the thigh yes. and um, that, that common perineal nerve, which just immobilizes the leg. When you hit it enough times, it just inflames and it decreases your mobility. But it, it, but the same goes for low low calf kicks, man. If, you know, I don't know if you remember Karate Kid three, that that evil sensei Ooh. was like, if a man <laughs> if a man can't stand, he can't fight. If a man yes. can't see, he can't fight. But if you can't stand, and you see it all the time, mm. that's why Conor McGregor was so successful in his second fight against Nate Diaz. Yes. He came out firing on those legs. Yes. And you know Nate's a boxer. You know he's a mm. good striker. But when you compromise your mobility and a and a leg. 
that changes how you throw fights, how you move, how you yeah. fire off your shots. And so it's, it, again, success leaves clues, and I'm glad to see these guys picking up on it. And I see even co uh, commenting for our last few case aggression fights, the uh, last three months, you just saw it. Like, fighters coming out, starting out with leg kicks, starting out with leg kicks, and just hammering them because mm -hmm. they know it's effective. You, you, you know, Again, if your fighter can't move the way he naturally moves, it's way more of an easy target to get to. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's all about developing a strategy and a game plan, obviously, which you're going to come in with, but having the the adaptability and the skills to say, oh, shit, this isn't working. Shit, look, oh, these low, oh, I'm going to have to change stance. And then yeah. let's look at it. If you're, if you're a, a, an orthodox, like how much time are you, are you spending training in the other stance? Like it should be, at this level of the game, and as we're highlighting how these youngsters are coming in, man, and they're coming in like training since they were six, totally disciplined, yeah. like, almost like I, a, say, I, always, I always say they're coming out of the womb with a blue belt, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> this is it. They're doing absolutely everything, you know, they're doing, they're, they're doing it all where, rather than maybe 10, 15 years ago, someone maybe, you know, uh, jiu-jitsu bjj taekwondo and then they'll say you know what i'm going to transition to to, to mixed martial arts i'll work on a bit of grappling yeah. blah 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 but i'm a i'm a, a specialist in this area you know like wonder boy um yeah but now everyone is pretty much a mixed martial artist yo you're absolutely correct and that's been going on for a while and that one of my favorites was cats out of the militage camp robbie lawler specifically matt yes. hughes man when matt hughes was the champ he really, because, you know, the early UFCs, it was all about what was your singular discipline. Mm -hmm. And some of it worked. Like Mark Mark Coleman, former heavyweight champ, he was very, mm -hmm. the father of ground and pound. He would yes. he would take you down as a wrestler and pound you out. Not a lot of submissions, not a kind of anaconda chokes, dark stars chokes. It worked for him. You know, even almost like Chuck Liddell, Chuck Liddell with a wrestling background and could choke you out. He was all about just knocking you out. Mm -hmm. But like Matt Hughes, he you know, the military fighting system really, in my opinion, was the Jeet Kune Do of MMA. And if anybody knows what Jeet Kune Do is, it's Bruce Lee's martial art of yes. combining all the different martial arts, taking what works and dispelling what, what doesn't work. And that to me is so practical. And so many people followed that, that lineage of the military fighting system, becoming complete martial artists. Like, you know, Pat said, if he was to ever select a team again, he would get D1, start with D1 wrestlers mm. and then build them from there. Because most fights end on the ground, mm. but you definitely need to have the, the additional techniques of not just taking them down, but, you know, like Matt Hughes, he was a killer striker. He could knock you out. He could wrestle you to death and slam you like he did Frank Trigg twice. And he could choke you out like he choked out Frank Trigg twice. So <laughs> the, the multiple multiple dimensional aspect of MMA that really began implemented with not just the military fighting system, but others, like you see now, you don't you don't have just one, like a Josh Koscheck was just kind of a wrestler and he had yeah. to refine his, but he didn't quite make that transition or any other fighters who couldn't quite move into the full 360 of, mm. of mixed martial arts they stay in one singular discipline and it cost them but yeah i mean you're absolutely right everyone is so encompassed the true art the true essence of mixed martial art it's awesome it really is it really is and it's exciting to see what what is going to be happening next over this these this next few years um i'm really still hopeful <laughs> obviously I, outside of the the the, the pandemic etc i'm hopeful that we can see obviously we haven't seen anything with bellator and rising this year but i'm really hopeful um that we can see some promotional some cross promotional work and not necessarily trading i'm talking about you know let let's let's do something together and let, let's see who how mm. we can cross fertilize you know promotions and stuff and you know um see who's the best ultimately well, yeah, and ultimately that's what it would prove. Like, who was the exact best? I mean, obviously you don't, you have a few promotions, but I'm like, UFC is, you know, pretty much the tried and true pinnacle. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of people who don't necessarily, for lack of a better term, cut it, um, go to, the, to, to like Bellator, not knocking them, but, you know, like Brian Bader, he didn't win the championship in, in the UFC, but he did when he went to Bellator. Again, not necessarily knocking them because they're all still badass fighters. But I just, I, I, I would love to see that happen. I don't, I don't know, just fight promoters and the fight game. It's, it's tough to, uh, it's tough to see that happening. Just because, yeah. you know, UFC is like, I'm not going to, you know, risk it, <laughs> well, risk it or somewhat risk it, but even, even lend credibility to a Bellator by cross promoting. Like you said, I mean, Dana knows they're like the second tier or whatever, or whatever mm -hmm. the next best of the UFC, but it's almost like, you know, let them do them. We'll do us. 
any any cross like I, I don't see it. I, I see the UFC coming on top of that on that one, and it just I don't think that would necessarily would help the Bellator brand because it would wind up proving I think what everybody kind of already knew. It would be exciting though. It would be definitely exciting. It would for, for, for name value, for, for historical purposes. Um, I think I think at some point, and, I, and I've hinted to this before, whether there's some 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 oligarch out there, some trillionaire, you know, <laughs> wants to wave some money around and say, look, I, I'm creating this this you know this program, and uh, I want to have all of you promotions fight at this event. I'm going to create this belt system, and whoever wins wins, kind of thing. Oh. Yeah, well, that's almost like as a, I don't watch professional wrestling too much anymore, or sports entertainment, whatever they call it. That's very similar to Cody Rhodes nowadays asking Vince McMahon of the WWE, "Hey, let's let's do some cross promotional stuff." I mean, obviously, one would give a rub to the other. The WWE being the mm. more pinnacle would give a rub to AEW, but I just don't see Vince putting that over in any way because it would just be like, why would I give any shine whatsoever to a competing? promotion I, I personally wouldn't care if i was vince i'm like i know my stuff's the better stuff yes and then well, they would just get a small rub from it <laughs> it's tried and tested i mean we we grew up on wwf aka wwe um aew from what i can see i mean i i'm clearly not into you know that type of stuff anymore but from what i've seen the highlights and stuff it looks it looks like a very good product i i haven't watched any of it either like you know the wrestling I love listening to Jim Cornette's podcast. You know who that is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I love Jim. I mean, he's so protective of the business that once was. But it's it's so far beyond that now. And I hate to even, you know, Vince let the cat out of the bag. I mean, the, we now know the how the magicians do their tricks. And it's not mm-hmm. even about, like, any, or suspending any disbelief anymore. Now it's just about high spot after high spot. This is yeah. awesome. I mean, there's yeah. no story to it. There, it's just all these crazy moves where i mean it, it is what it is like i said i don't really watch it anymore but, but... It, but jeff it's so big it's still so big i mean you if you can correct me but isn't it as big as it was when we were growing up no definitely not as big as when we were growing up but there's i mean there's when we were growing up i mean outside of the wwe there were also territories that slowly started to disappear yes but i mean even with the network anymore wrestlers are not making I don't think near as what they were back in the day. They had the options of territories. And even now, you know, with pay-per-views, you know, wrestlers used to get a bonus depend or, you know, a pay-per-view cut depending on where they were on the pay-per-view. Now there's no real pay-per-view money because everyone's buying the network for $5. Oh. So WWE network's making a killing, but the wrestlers aren't making near what I think they used to. The road schedule is probably a little different, still a little hectic. They're still paying their own costs as far as travel, rent a car, hotels. But wait, whoa, I think whoa, 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 whoa. They're paying their own costs, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. The wrestlers, uh, most of the times, if not 90% of the time, if not more, they pay their own travel, pay their own hotel rooms, rental cars, plane, whatever. I didn't. That's been going on for years. Wow, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. That that, that, that just seems like if that's part of your business, isn't it? Isn't that part of work? No, they're, they're, in, they're not employees. They're 1099, what they call 1099. Ah. They're, they're, they're independent contractors. So. Yes. Yeah. That old gag. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's been working for a long time, which is such bullshit. I'm sorry. I don't mean to cuss if I can't cuss. No, let's go for it, man. Go for it. Vince, Vince is saying these stars can't do third party stuff like Twitter or Cameo and all this other crap, but yet they're making them pay. I mean, they're paying them peanuts compared to what it used to be, and they're paying their own way. And now they can't go do other third party ventures to supplement their income. It's wow. bogus. If I'd be like, I, I, I'm with that. If I'm an employee of the WWE, yeah. health insurance, all this other stuff. But if I'm a ten, if I'm an independent contractor, I'm doing what the fuck I want to do. Totally. I mean, but a lot of these guys sign those contracts anyway because there's not a lot of options at all. You know, you got TNA, Ring of Honor, WWE, AEW. But you know, obviously WWE is the you know the king of the castle. So yeah, these guys kind of oh, take it. They're they're clearly skilled, athletic be specimens both male and female i don't know is is it really is is the a law an attraction of being a a wrestler that that applicable anymore maybe they should yeah know. yeah it is i mean especially the young i mean you got obviously wrestling too like you said about ufc or mma is a young man's sport you know there's there's still most, and I'm not knocking anybody because I'm a mark too. Most of them are just marks for the sport. 
Like, I just want to have said I worked for the WWE. I don't care how poorly. And they find out once they get there. They get there like, oh, my God, I'm with the WWE. And after a couple of years, they're treated poorly and they're asked for the release. And either they get it or they don't get it. Mm. But it's more the idea they're enamored with, I think, oftentimes. Some people are straight up good workers and just, you know, love wrestling and want to be, you know, take bumps and be a part of the sport. But I think yeah. other people, it's just more the romanticization, romanticization yes. of being with, I'm with the WWE, even though it's not even close to what it was. And that's changed so much that even just the last rather short period of time, you just don't see, like um, like Jim Cornette has said, they've, I'm sorry, they've taken away the stars. There's no stars anymore. Everyone's just kind of, whatever the word is, just uh, it's just a hodgepodge of all these just same, simil very similar characters. You don't see Andre the Giants or Big John Studd yeah. or King Kong. Everyone looks the same. Everybody's ripped. Everybody's tan. Everybody's hair is all wet when they come out. <laughs> like you just don't see, you just don't see this variety of characters like you used to see anymore. And you know they've kind of they've kind of made it. So we don't want to create stars. We just want to create these personalities that people want to see. No, no more rocks. No more Stone Colds. No more CM Punks. Mm. It's 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 it's. I don't know. It's. I guess it, it's still working. I mean, it's still a, clearly a viable business, you know. Well, they're they're well, it, which is interesting because their ratings are just dog shit. They're not even close to compared to what they used to be back. And even the W, the Monday Night Wars, or even with Stone Cold. I mean, the ratings are just abysmal. That's why I found it so funny that NBC, the Peacock Network, bought a part, basically bought the WWE or licensed it to stream their stuff for like six years or whatever it is. Because it's it's just not as I mean it's still a thing but it's not nearly as financially viable as it used to be for the WWE it is yeah it's because they're you know making hell of money off the network but for the wrestlers there's no trickle down they get what they get and that's pretty much it like I said there's no there's no more DVD sales so there's no more like commission checks or whatever to get there's no more pay per views so I mean those guys used to get hugely paid off DVD sales pay per view buys that's all gone now they so just get kind of a flat rate just to be there. How about merchandising? Are they still doing like the little figurines and the the the, the belts and all yeah. that? Yeah, kind of yeah. I imagine. I don't know for sure, but I can I can only imagine on the W. They you know they sell T-shirts and figurines still, but it's just again their their revenue is reduced to just a fraction of what it used to be. Poor Vince. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, I don't know. Poor Vince. I, yeah. Um... You know, it, it can't last forever, unfortunately. It can't last forever. No, well, and that's and that's the thing. There's, you know, wrestling has a cyclical nature as far as popularity, but even your biggest company, I mean, even like the UFC, I mean, it'll be around for a while, but there's going to, I mean, something will come up eventually. I mean, I know that's a big dog to try to topple off the mountain, but well, nothing lasts forever. Do you know who I think is close? I mean, I haven't done any financials. And I, I, well, I've looked at something, and it doesn't show that one championship are, are as financially stable as you'd think. But in regards to their product and the fighters they've got, a lot of them aren't as well-known and, and household names. But I think they're very close. One? Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, that's... <laughs> They're the biggest, I mean, that's Asia. Asia is the biggest continent on the planet. So it's mm -hmm. like, that's, um, when they pack those venues, it's like, it's, it's huge. huge. I don't know how much money they're making necessarily, but yeah, this, I mean, that's, that's a huge market. And if we think the UFC has got the USA and the globe, the, not mostly the USA lockdown, USA, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just North America, man. When you talk about Asia, that's, that's a huge, huge market. And like I said, I haven't, like you said, I haven't done any financial crunching on any of those numbers, but. I can only imagine. I can only imagine how, you know, because it's hugely popular over there. Crazy. And also, which I think is a good thing that they're doing, it's it's not just obviously uh, mixed martial arts. They're doing the kickboxing. They're doing the Muay Thai. Uh, that's what I love. I, uh, yeah, I definitely love that. And that's why I, I, it, it's easy to get fatigue, man. Easy to get MMA fatigue. So you want, like I said, switch it up. Have some bouts be MMA, have some bouts be boxing, some bouts be Muay Thai or kickboxing, mm. some be grappling, jujitsu. Yes. You know, variety is the spice of life, man. And I think I think that's important because it's, you know, you, you could easily get MMA fatigue, in totally. my humble opinion. Well, especially being in North America, I mean, I don't have access to watch the PFL. I don't have access to watch, well, LFA if you get Fight Pass. I think that LFA is on Fight Pass, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but outside that, if you don't have Fight Pass, for instance, 
<laughs> the only they've thing got a lot could... of promotions on Fight Pass too. Some some good fights, some good fighters. Well, they've taken, which is I'm very disappointed. I'm happy, but at the same time, I'm disappointed. Cage Cage Warriors that used to be on, you know, free to air television over here. Was it and Cage Cage Fury? No, Cage Warriors, the UK one. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Did they um? They've done a deal, I think, as of last year or the year before, and they're they're strictly on <laughs> on Fight Pass now. Yeah, that's and I think that's interesting too. And I mean, honestly, kudos to Dana for providing a platform for upping. I mean, because he could just totally be Vince about it and just totally try to squash him or buy him out. Yeah. So I mean, I think that's really really cool. That uh, I mean, he knows that no one's really going to be touching UFC, but a lot of those companies like LFA, they are their feeder systems. Exactly for the UFC, so it behooves them to help promote those platforms. And again, similar to Cage Aggression, I mean, we've had we've had a few fighters on Cage Aggression that have gone on to uh, the Ultimate Fighter or given a UFC contract. I mean, so it's, it's the, these platforms are no, I mean, these these promotions are no joke. And again, I mean, Vin, um, Dana can be totally selfish about it, but I think that's really cool to provide, you know, attention and a platform for other promotions who are doing, doing really good stuff to, to be seen. Yes. I don't know how much money they're getting for it, for you know, how much juice is worth the squeeze, quite frankly. Well, it's getting more attention because obviously it's, you know, outside of the UK and maybe, you know, some parts of Europe, no one else is really paying attention. Unless you're a hardcore, then you might be looking, okay, how can I watch, you know, that, that event over there in the UK, obviously with the time zone difference, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it gives more eyes. It lends more eyes on the promotion itself, on the fighters. And it is clearly a feeder system. It's clearly a fe- feeder yeah. system to the UFC. Well, there, and again, there's a global audience for, for all these promotions, dude. And we, even with our pay-per-view metrics, we're able to see what buys are going on across the planet. Obviously, we're, we're selling, you know, hell is in the U.S., but, you know, the U.K., Ireland, you know, Northern Africa, uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's just, it's really cool to see. I mean, obviously, it's a global sport. And it's growing faster than I think any sport I've ever seen, but I mean I think it's it's really it's really heartening to see. I mean, like I said, these these kids at Case Aggression are super talented, and with this platform we set up, the pay per view and the production is just through the roof. I mean, it's cool to see that people have interest in in watching even just not even a small promotion, but you know, a Midwest promotion like ours, because you know, there's again, there's just so much talent out here, man, so much talent. Well, the good thing about it is you've you've got the you know the the Hall of Famers, you know, Militich. Well, well and... that's that's definitely unique. I don't know of a lot of promotions that have two UFC legends mm. calling their fights for them. I mean, that's that again, that's something you know. We're never going to be the UFC, but we try to establish different things which differentiate us from other promotions. Whether it's having Pat and Jen's calling the fights, our pay per view platform. Uh, within our pay per view pat- platform, you can buy the fights through specific fighters. We call it like basically a referral code. So if I was fighting, you could buy the pay-per-view through Jeff Wilson and like proceeds. I think it's 20, a certain percentage. I forget what it is. Yeah. You know, I, I get, so if, if you're a popular fighter fighting out of Jackson Winkle, John, or a big camp and you got a huge social media following, you want to come to cage aggression. Cause not only are you going to get paid your official pay, but you could also leverage that popularity and have your crew, your hometown, your city buy the pay-per-view through your name. And then you cash out that way too. And that's a huge component that we've set up uh, just really from COVID. You know what I mean? The gate, we can't do a full capacity venue like we've wanted to. So I think with this referral code for specific fighters to have their pay-per-view bought through, it helps kind of supplement um, their income that they yeah. you know, would have got on, on a big gate. So that's a huge, very unique aspect that I don't, I don't see any other promotion doing. And that kudos, as you say, hats off for, for doing that. It's, you know, clearly the promotion is not just, just focus on, you know, become, becoming the best or the greatest kind of thing and, and profit right. or orientated. It's about, you know, the, the 360 holistic view, you know, we can bring forth some good talent, you know, we can help promote them, you know, we can, you know, give them some extra money where possible, you know, you help us while we help you kind of thing. It's a symbiotic relationship without a mm-hmm. doubt. Even Jordan Henman, the guy who, you know, suffered the big injury, after the spinning elbow, he's joining the commentating team, but we have him on the referral code to buy the pay-per-view, even though he's not fighting, because he incurred, I think it was like $80,000 in medical expenses. Wow. Some of it was taken care of through insurance, but he still definitely has some left over. So again, this referral code helps him, you know, bridge the gap on what he still owes for his medical expenses. So the promotion and Mike Goodwin, the CEO, very, very much so takes care of his fighters, looks out for his fighters. Um, and, and, you know, I'm just growing up 
not just in watching the fight game and promoters, whether it's Don King, you know, Vince McMahon, yeah. they, they tend to be sometimes very shady mm. and not very, um, not very take care of their fighters very well. But like my good one, man, he's just an extreme gentleman. He's been doing this for 10 years and he's got nothing but love for his fighters. So I think that's, that's a really, that's another reason why I find it really cool to be a part of the, the organization. Excellent. And talk, talk a little bit more about the, um, Obviously, you've had, was it uh, a third of the capacity, was it? A what? Third of the yeah, capacity. Yeah, I think it's, we're down to, I think it's 30%. So yeah. we, what we can normally do at 3,000, we got to take it down, you know, however much that is. And that's what we've been working with from uh, October, November, December. And Iowa is one of the looser states that have loosened the restrictions, masks, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this particular venue, the River Center, still has their specific rules up, so um this time we can't do it at full capacity but we're hoping we have another fight m- uh, may 8th uh 8th and 9th that weekend it's only going to be a two-night event only only a two-night event <laughs> i know you say only <laughs> yeah but uh hopefully we'll be up to full capacity by then um you know if not again we still have the pay-per-view platform but yeah we're, we're looking to i saw dana white just announced that uh the first full capacity yeah fight 161 or whatever it is down in jacksonville here in a few weeks um, I'll actually be down there, and I think Pat's going to come down, so we might do some live broadcasting from that from that uh, first in a long time full capacity event. Man, I can't wait to see it. It's so weird watching these fights and these everything with no crowd. It's just so Ooh, weird. Initially, initially, yeah, I, I I thought the same, but at the same time, I, I can see its pluses and I can see its negatives. Um, negative, and obviously the pluses is the atmosphere and and all of that, the noise and you know, yeah, yeah. um. But with just just that silence, being able to hear the blows, being able to hear the when they will turn the mics on, to hear the corners, you know, shouting instructions yeah, and all that, yeah. it it gets it back to the rawest element of of of, of the sport of the, of the game in essence, and it takes takes the crowd elements out of it. So it it can't be a case of oh well, you know, the crowds, you, you know, some fighter, well, the ego, as we know, is a very powerful thing. Oh, and sure. we have uh, thousands of people and I don't want to make, I don't want to look bad in front of these people. I, I've said I was going to knock this guy out in the first round, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> first... I would imagine that the focus, the focus element is more enhanced because you don't have that kind of distraction of, mm-hmm. and, and, and you know, when you, you know, when you watch fights and somebody punches somebody, it's like, Ooh, mm. and even though you have your game plan for the more undisciplined fighters, that kind of can sway them. Like, Oh, you think that was an, Ooh, watch this. I'm going to get yes. him back. You know what I yes. mean? It just kind of lends itself to becoming unfocused. But yeah, I mean, I just, it, I do, I've always loved it because it's just, whether it's WrestleMania or UFC, the, the crowd experience is a huge part of it. Maybe not so much for the fighters, but just like the viewing audience. But I, I've always wondered, I was actually, you know, coming as I was driving out here to the park to do this conversation, I wanted to ask Pat about that because, you know, how much, how much did, did, would that matter to him? You know, having the crowd there, having it not there. And I think as, as focused as Pat was, as disciplined he was, he's like, I, I wouldn't care. Yeah. I'm just listening from my corner. Exactly. I mean, I know, I know he doesn't have that ego aspect of, of doing it for the crowd. I mean, the crowd bonus is awesome when you knock somebody the hell out, but yes. during the fight, it's, I mean, like a, someone like a Pat is probably way more focused, but, I, I can only imagine some of these other fights. I'm, I'm sure the thought process is probably different. On some love it, some don't mind it, some hate it. Yeah, because I guess it's the, the it's the energy. You know, you come into or you know, there's Without probably doubt. There's, there's 40 people in there, camera crew, and you know, Dana yeah. sitting on. Like, where the hell? Where am I, man? Is this a well, sparring that's match? Why, that's what. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm in the gym. Yeah. That's why when when we fought or when we called Jordan Hinman's fight, and he caught that that elbow. I mean, you couldn't the crowd i mean there was a nice crowd but it wasn't a full crowd there was no food or drink served so everyone was just literally just sitting there and you could you know you could hear a pin dropped on cotton mm. so when he caught that elbow it was like a it was like a hammer hitting a coconut and you just heard that pop and everybody in there heard it. even pat like i said if you if you go on cage aggression and you watch that fight and watch the end of it it was only a first round fight like pat hopped up like he hopped up and i heard i mean i just i was they were both right in front of us in front of the commentating table there but like even just Pat intrinsically knew like, oh, that's bad. That's really bad. You know, and it was just like I said, you just heard it that it's reverberated throughout that like silent crowd. So it's, it definitely has its interesting elements to it with the no crowd. 
a hundred percent it's going to be good you know for financially for the organizations and you know if the if the fighters then receive some extra money based upon that even better because as we all know um the higher up you go as well <laughs> it becomes a very slanted view in regards to the the pay that the promotion receives versus yeah. the pay it's it's crazy it's absolutely it really crazy <laughs> it really is and they've got that so um there's that conglomerate have got that um that case against ufc for for, uh, for pay which seems to have gone to the, the next step have you heard anything about that um i know there was a class action with a bunch of different fighters that was yeah. a little while ago i thought it had gotten dismissed but i just haven't stayed up on it it was like john fitch mark hunt yes apparently as of maybe a month or so ago maybe a bit longer um they're actually considering it's at a point where the ufc should potentially make a settlement or something or or file some other motions so it they've, possibly they've, they've presented well, a lot of, of that information was the unionization i know i don't know if mark and those guys were talking about unionizing fighters and that kind of stuff i don't know if that was part of the same suit but there definitely needs to be some changes made i mean the, the amount of money they wound up getting paid whatever it is 12 to show or 12, and yeah. then like they got to pay their corners they got to pay their i mean they're literally fighting for peanuts man for nothing i mean eight and eight like what are we talking yeah four and four like what are we talking about on, on, on the yeah. ufc you're a yeah. ufc fighter right and everyone's like ufc you oh my god you're fighting for the ufc yeah 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 and then you get your fight <laughs> I still can't pay my bills <laughs> but again I mean, it's almost it's it's very similar to the kids wanted to sign up for the WWE, even though it's not the same as it was. It's almost the romanticization. Mm. Not, not necessarily just to be a part of the UFC, but they know you reach those pinnacles, man. You start getting those pay-per-view cuts. You start getting that Conor McGregor money mm. or whatever the money that is. But again, it's almost like the, the, the percentage of people who are going to make it to the UFC is definitely smaller. Any yeah. professional fight or, fight or sports organization. Yes. And the, to get to the upper echelon of making the money is even a bigger, you know, long shot. And I'm not, I'm not deterring people to not do it. I'm just saying what, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze, man? Cause a lot of these guys are fighting and fighting and getting skipped over in the ranks, yes. the title shot that they've earned for freaking peanuts, man. Well, for since, freaking, especially since you've, you've, you've said that, um, the last event that took place with the uh, no contest where we've got Rocky Leon, Rocky Edwards on a eight fight winning streak, mm -hmm. rank number three. Um, should have fought for Tyrone Woodley, but you know the the, the event took place and they had to cancel it, etc. Um, then they, they tried to make that fight with that the up the upstart um, Hamzat Shamayev. Oh yeah, the guy that. with the COVID. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So he's got COVID now and, and lasting effects of that apparently. Um, yeah. so that's been cancelled three times. So then Leon, Leon's like, look, I, I want to fight. You know, I, I want to fight. I can't be sitting out here all this time. It's been a year plus. Um, yeah. Takes the fight with, with, with Bilal. Um, and from what it looked like, if the iPod didn't take place, he was going to get taken out very quickly. Leon or the other gentleman? The other guy. The other guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's from what I... I did not see that fight, unfortunately, but I heard he was... He was pretty much winning anyway. He looked excellent. He looked very, very good. Now, as a result of this now, you know, yesterday, what does Dana White come out with? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Usman is now going to be fighting Jorge Masbel. We're going to do a, a part two because he only had a little bit of training, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. get yeah. full camp. And even though we know yeah. that's lies and he was training, he was, he was well and training for this opportunity and he was helping also train Dustin Poirier. Yeah. It's, it's like, what are we doing, Uncle Dana? <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, again, he, it, it, and, you know, he's over the last several years has not completely abdicated the rankings, but, and part of me likes it and part of me doesn't like it because I don't like to see these people who've been working their butt off who are in the rankings get skipped over. But again, it has to be a balance. It's like Dana is so mindful of fights that are going to sell, not just fights to adhere to the rankings. He wants to make money off them. You know what oh, I mean? Yes. So I don't know how much he sees huge value. I know he's not a huge fan of Tyron, and I, I'm sure he's not a huge fan of how the Leon Edwards fight ended. To I mean, but Leon's like, come on, man. I'm not running it back with that guy. I've been whooping everybody's ass. What are you and doing? It, I beat him, and I was going to beat him. I guess yeah. I, he got, his eyes got poked. I get it, and I'm sorry for that. Mm -hmm. But it's like, can we, can we move on, or do I have to now 
train for however long to fight this guy again just to delay my, you know, getting a title shot. I mean, it's 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 a tough game, man. I mean, I hate to be in Dana's shoes, but it's uh again, it's tough to to strike that that fine balance of appeasing the fans and adhering to quote unquote the rankings. Yes, but I, I, we can go down to lightweights and we can look at Dustin Poirier. You know, who took out Conor McGregor, who we shouldn't have, according to the, all of the the lead up and all of the the media. Oh, you know, well, I, I knew. I I honestly I knew because Dustin had been murking people. Exactly, he's improved. In- exactly, he's improved yeah, tremendously. Yeah, and that last fight was however many years ago, and he's been on he's mm. been on a tear while Conor just hasn't been. No, nope. I mean they're both are supremely talented, but exactly. you know, I I know some people don't believe in ring rust. I mean, maybe it's just not ring rust, but just. Just inactivity. inactivity. I guess that's almost a different yeah. euphemism for ring rust, but it's like you got to stay active in this well, game. Look. These guys are freaking if, they're if, hungry. If you don't, if you've just learned how, if you, you're riding a bike and then you, you start riding a bike, uh, no, let's, let's go even further, one step further. You, you, you've learned to ride a penny farthing and you've been riding that for a month and then you put it down and start just riding a regular mountain bike. And you pick it up next year. Are you going to be able to jump on that damn penny farthing? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. People say it's just like riding a bike, but I mean, no. There's certain adjustments you need to make as far as balance and just, mm. I mean, just, just the very subtle things. Just the very, I mean, there's one thing to spar and there's one thing to work out. I mean, it's just something else about being in the ring or in the cage and, yes. and actual, you know, Poirier's coming at you. And I mean, his game plan was was solid. solid. Connor had nothing for those leg kicks. He didn't no. check us. I, I don't remember him checking a single one. Even after no. he just kept lighting them up and lighting them up. Yeah, just kind of let it happen. Pretty much, pretty much. And as 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 the the the, the saying for 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 Dustin is now paid in full, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> as well, he should be, dude. As well, he should be. Give the man the belt, man. I mean, stop courting Khabib and the media saying, yeah, I know he said he's retired, but, he, you know, we got to run that, you know, he's got to come back for, 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 for Connor. But why would he come back for Connor if, if Connor's already got beaten? And, like, what are we well, talking that, about? That, him losing against Dustin did not help his case against a, a rematch against Khabib. Khabib completely dominated him. And so maybe if he had, I guess he did fight Cerrone again after that and looked pretty impressive, but what well, looked impressive. But yeah, it didn't. It did him no favors as far as calling out Khabib uh, to lose to Dustin. Not that Dustin was a slouch, and that was it was a great fight. And Dustin, I think, deserves a title shot. He's the champ. He's the champ. In my he's eyes, he's the interim now. No, oh, nah. yeah, I, no, no. I'm just in, in my eyes. He's the champion. He he. That was a that was the the, the for the undisputed tra- strap, um, or at minimum for the interim. He, he's the champ again because yeah. he's, he's beat everybody. He, he's done what he needs to do. He's been in well, some I don't crazy even know those wars. exact rankings, but if Khabib dipped out, like who else is ranked number one? In, it's you know, Dustin. It's, Dustin. Yeah. It's like he, yeah, he deserves at least that interim. It's it's madness. I mean, trustfully, you know. Uh, well, I think Gaethje, there's Gaethje and Chandler in the works. Yeah, that's uh, coming up. I think I forget what they said. I, I don't even remember, but I just saw that announced uh, yesterday. I think that'll be a good one. That'll be a good one. It sure will. It sure will. Um, I mean, Mike has looked excellent in that very short <laughs> performance he had with um, poor Dan Hooker. I expected a lot more from Dan Hooker in that in that fight. Um, I'm wondering if he's going to get. Uh, how do I say this? You know, equal treatment from Usada because uh, <laughs> Mr. Chandler he looks great, but I don't think that's all necessarily spinach and bananas. <laughs> chicken breast. <laughs> I uh, maybe it's chicken breast from Mexico. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe some of them Alistair Overeem <laughs> horse meats. This is it. It's um I've heard that as well. I haven't I, I he hasn't been busted for it though, has he? Historically. Overeem? No, um Chandler. No, I, no not Chandler. Well, he fought in Bellator. I don't know how their testing system works. I don't think they use USADA. No, I think it's a less stringent uh, yes testing system than than. But even I mean, even Usada, I think it's very select. I mean, it's it's a I strange don't... one because look at the John Jones thing and picograms and all these yeah, stuff yeah. and like what are we yeah. doing? If yeah. he's been caught, <laughs> if he's been caught with an illegal flipping steroid in his system, then he 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 can't fight, and you can't move a whole event to a totally different state so the guy can fight. 
Yeah, yeah, that was ridiculous. Well, and it, it's it, that was so beautiful. It's like, no, it seems like he will always, <laughs> always test for some level of picogram. We just there's nothing we can do about it. Like, really? <laughs> we're just gonna That's just, it. We're just gonna like just have to, you know just give up the. Oh no, he's he's on something, but you know it's just it's a pico, which I get a picogram small, but it's like, what's up with him? Has he been doing it so much that he has he will always have yes. that in him, or like what's going on? Well, that just proves two things that the tests are that sophisticated that they can pick up like minuscule amounts of any yes. kind of drug. Um, yes, exactly. And then also, like, yeah, so good. Also, that <laughs> it, 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 could it have been a, a whole batch of tainted supplements that this guy's been using for a, a, a lengthy period of time? Well, which is hugely possible because I know some of them, I mean, someone was telling me they. They combine, you know, they accidentally combine bad stuff with good stuff when they make them over in China or wherever they make them. So they they won't fully clean out the, the vats. tainted yeah. vats or whatever, and then they'll put the other stuff in. So there is these trace amounts. I'm not even sure if that's. I I figured. I don't know. I figured they were doing some more injectable stuff, but I exactly. don't know. But like you said, Usada, they they test for. I mean, it's down to the <laughs> clearly the picogram. <laughs> I wish I've never even heard of before until this situation. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Pico Graham just, Jones. I'm just not sure they. I'm just not sure they. They test. I know they test people a lot. I remember Dominic Cruz talking about, you know, 6 a.m. They're at their door, and I've heard other fighters say, "Man, they're at my door at like 5, 6 a.m., which is just crazy." But I mean, just looking at some of these fighters, I'm just like, "Man, you're getting up there in age, and you look freaking amazing." Like, well, a, like a Brock Lesnar. Like, yeah, there's a <laughs> wellness policy in the WWE. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm no, very Brock, interested. You can skip this wellness policy check this week. <laughs> oh yeah, don't worry, don't worry, Brock. You can, you know, you can, you can yeah, pass this you're good. <laughs> We know you're on all the juice, so <laughs> and a little bit more, <laughs> and a little bit more. I love him though. I mean, he's you know incredible athlete. But... Most definitely, but very much exposed um, when he fights. If he's fighting mixed martial arts, he he does get exposed. If he's fighting a well versed and rounded um, opponent. Um, yeah, who did he beat for the title? It was an impressive win. I think it was Shane Carwin. Carwin, pretty, yes. A very impressive arm triangle after pretty much almost getting, you know, knocked out in the first round. But mm. Shane blew himself up and then, you know, Brock took advantage of him and got a freaking arm or a arm triangle, which I was like, oh, my God, check this guy out. Check him out, innit? <laughs> but then he, whoever he fought, I think it was, oh, I think it was Overeem or somebody. He just does, he did not like getting hit. Overeem Stomach. destroyed him. He yeah, was those knees, yeah. yeah. And he's supposed to have had, and then, then they came out with, he had, what, Triculitis, Diverticulitis. That's Diverticulitis. It. yeah. That did not feel good, I'm sure, going to his midsection with some knees from Overeem. But you could just see in his, even his other fights, he just did not like being punched. He would, you know, do that turn and kind of curl up. Yes. I mean, it's just not not someone who's been fighting for a long time. But I mean, he's from a physics standpoint, he's so huge. Even give him a few tools. Yeah. And you know, he obviously did what he did, which was pretty impressive. 100%. He made, the, he made that mark. He made that mark within the... Um... He absolutely did. You cannot take that away from him. The mm. man was a freaking UFC heavyweight champ. And not to take anything away from um, CM Punk. I mean, it was a total reverse <laughs> in regards to the, evo- the, the results, but he tried, yeah. man. Yeah, he did. He, but, I mean, uh, that was like, that was a freak show. Yeah. That was, again, that was Dana trying to appease the crowd. That guy had no business, business in none. a UFC cage. None. Not against Darren Till, not against Mike Jackson, even though Mike Jackson struggled to, you know, to win that fight. But I mean, Pat, Pat actually cornered Mike Jackson for that fight. But um, yeah, CM Punk, that was more a, a testament to the Mike dude getting in there. Mm. But it definitely was not on merit. That was on name yes. and, and pay-per-view buys and shit mm. like that. 100%. Which is what you know, even even Randy Couture fighting James Tony, it was a freak show. I didn't like seeing it. it was it was just what it was. But I'm like, nah, man, we this is the UFC, dude. This is this is a meritocracy. You can't just be in here because you talk some shit and a lot of people know you, because that's a slippery slope into, you know, your your almost WWE freaking you know, backyard mud show just <laughs> nonsense. And harkening back to the uh, the days of the UFC one and two and three, I guess when you know, yeah, who was the guy who came in with just the one glove on? <laughs> yeah, Al uh, Jimmins. Al Jimmins, I think his name was. <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> uh, and again, you don't know what you don't know at the time, but it's like you look back on it. Well, like, oh, but think that? about it. But think about it. Right, this is no holes bar. You could actually punch in the yeah. groin and all. You couldn't get out um, eye gouge, but. 
boxing glove. You got a 10 ounce boxing glove that that's going to give just one too. Like, Oops. like that left hand is so powerful. I what? have to shield it a little bit. Otherwise, I'll this is someone. it. Why shield it? Let's <laughs> keep the flipping, keep your, 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 your wrist, you know, strapped up nice and tight. So you it's yeah. immobile. And then you've got a perfect hammer there. Forget the yeah. glove. You don't need a pillow on the end of it. <laughs> who, who did he fight? He didn't even, I think it was maybe Shamrock or maybe it was Gracie or Shamrock. One of the two. They were getting, they weren't even real. They were like step one of a 10 step <laughs> move of choking him. And like step two, Al Jim and start tapping. Like he didn't even want the smoke at all. He's like, I don't know what this dude's doing, but I can't, move. <laughs> I can't move. I'm freaking out. Tap, 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 tap. That was oh, adorable. He was, he was the good old days. The good old days. We've come so, oh, so goodness. far. Or hey. uh, what was it? Ron Van Cleef, I think his name. He competed. Oh, he Cleef. He was the, wasn't he the karate guy? Yeah, yeah. If he was fifty-one when he competed, yeah. that, he got served up. But still, again, you you just don't know what you don't know. Because I think back in the day, it was the UFC one, et cetera, was more like these are kind of tough man contests, basically. Exactly. Yes. It was kind of one-dimensional. Again, people just kind of being one thing, if at all. Some people were just big, strong men who fought in bars or whatever, and some of them did well. But I mean, it was obviously, you know, as as it evolved, you saw as we see now, like we talked about the evolution of the sports, so beyond next level now, it's ridiculous. Most definitely. As we wind this um, conversation down, Jeff, um, what are your thoughts on the most recent spate of um, no contests and illegal knees to downed opponents and stuff? Because there seems to be a lot. Well, I guess it's we'll say it's 50 50. You've got people calling the new um, champ Aljamain Serling um, a, a, an actor. And he's a, he's a smart businessman. Uh, the Oscar goes to... Yeah, yeah. And then you've got, on the other hand, people saying, well, wait a minute. He got need in his, in his fucking head, man. Like, what are we talking about? You didn't even see the knee go in. Um, I'm surely you're not the first person to be able to put yourself into somebody else's body to know what they're feeling. Without like, a doubt. Without a doubt. I mean, it, it's for me. So the eye poke thing, that's been going on forever. And they need to address those gloves because a lot of those fighters, when they throw that jab out as a feeler, yeah. their, their fingers are extended. And you've been, John Jones is kind of notorious for that. Mm. That happens a lot. And I don't think that's necessarily an intentional thing. But, I, you know, me personally, just watching Sterling. No, you're absolutely right. And that's what a lot of people are saying. Like, hey, you guys didn't catch that knee. So you don't know exactly how it felt to me. Just having watched the sport for years and having seen people catch you know, the cyborg guy who got his face crushed Ooh, by Santos. Michael Venom Page. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was like he didn't. But I mean, again, it might have been that period a more severe. To me, it just seemed like he was laying it on a little thick. I'm sure it hurt. I cannot say it didn't hurt because, I mean, that guy, he freaking squared up on him and boom. Mm. And that's completely unacceptable for Yan as a champion to do something so undisciplined. Yeah. I mean, it, it, whatever if you, you want to discuss like whether fighters should lose their belts off disqualification i mean technically yes they should but it was like when i saw sterling it just kind of laying it on a little thick and i know he knows the rules of like hey if he gets disqualified of this you got the belt for me personally I but would wait a minute ever... jeff <clears throat> wait a minute let me let me pause you on that point i've spoken to a lot of and i'm sure you have as well um fighters and they don't know the full set of, they probably know 30 percent of the rules well, those are, those are what those fight meetings are for. For me personally, I thought the rule was if one hand is on the ground, you can't you can't knee him. And yes. both of Sterling's head were behind his head, so I didn't. I, I'm not a judge, so I didn't get into necessarily the nuance of the judging. But in my opinion, I thought it was one hand was on the ground. Yeah. But again, it was. it was super undisciplined of Yan, and you know, unfortunately, the rules are the rules. I don't know if Sterling milked it. But for me personally, just from an optics standpoint, mm -hmm. like I told him, like, don't let Dana put that belt on you. Don't let him swing it around your waist. Mm -hmm. And he did, but immediately he took it off and dropped it. Like, that's what I wanted to see him do. I yeah. did not want to see him stunt with the belt because mm -hmm. even though he got it, he didn't win it. No, like, legit. he didn't earn he it. Was, he didn't. No, he didn't earn it. He wasn't winning the fight either. Almost like the Leon Edwards. Like, he, Leon was winning that fight and probably would have won. Yes. Yan was winning that fight against Sterling and probably would have won. Obviously, we don't know now, but... It's just, you, it, would you have given the uh, do you, uh, my score was um, Aljo got the first round clearly, even though he got dropped, but the the, the pace and the, the the significant strikes at Kutcher, I think he definitely got ground one I think two, Jan got three 
I honestly don't remember how specifically yeah. the, each round played out. But I, in my, when I'm watching it, I'm like, it, Sterling just looked slow. Like I said, he, when I was calling the fights with Pat live on a certain channel, um, it looked like he was fighting in water. To me, hmm. it just looked like he was slow. I, I don't, it, I didn't see him doing anything necessarily dominant. But you know, it's hard to call fights and then talk to people or anything. But I mean, it, it was to me, it looked like Yan had it pretty, pretty, pretty well handled. Hmm. But you know, it's, it is what it is as far as the knee. Um, I think regardless of how Sterling played it, they were still going to disqualify him with slow mode. Like he needed him when he was down illegal. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. he, Sterling could have stood right up and been fine. But I think the fact that he just needed in and of itself, need him in and of itself is what it would have cost him the title. But from an optic standpoint and a PR standpoint, you know, you have people like, you know, people would just say, Hey man, he got the belt. It was an illegal knee. But from, from Sterling standpoint, you just can't be going out to after parties with the belt on your shoulder and, you know, flossing like you're the champ, champ, because yeah, yeah. you're not. I mean, yeah. technically you are, but it just, it just, it, it's for me, me personally, I could be completely talking on my, it, it's just a bad look. Yes. I know. Because, I, I mean, almost he has to be like, man, I, I don't want to win it like that, dude. I know yeah. I realize the rules say I'm the champion now, but that's not how I want it when that's not how I'm going to build my legacy off. You know what I mean? And that yeah. just makes for better PR. People are like, yeah, that's how you do it, champ. That's how, you know, you don't do it like you knocked him out in five seconds or something. Mm. Have you, did you listen to his um his his podcast after the uh, week weekly scraps where he explained? Okay, well he he um because obviously he's been mocked and attacked on so social media and oh, for sure. on, and on you know I think uh well most of the MMA podcasts um and YouTubers they they're not being as nice as you would think um especially being ex fighters and judges and stuff. Um, yeah. he's basically come out and said, yes, there is footage of me, um, with the belt on smiling with people. That's because I was at wherever they stay, you know, he's the residents what, what, after the fights and his friends and family who loads of them came to the event to support him, wanted to celebrate and wanted to take photographs with him and the belt. So yeah. he obliged. And then after he, he separated himself and said, okay, you know, you've had your pictures now, like, I just want to chill kind of thing. Let's just celebrate, you know, us being here together kind of thing. It yeah. wasn't necessarily him. And apparently, I haven't checked, but it's not on his social media. This is on other people's social media. Um, so that would explain that. And you're 100% correct. He he didn't, you know, as a fighter, and he even said himself, I, I don't feel like a, like a champion because I didn't win it properly. Well, but and then, good for him. Yes. But it's just that I get a bad taste in my mouth, as I say, when people are, you know, and everyone's entitled their own, to their own opinion. But when people are just being like hella harsh and just like, yo, my guy's an actor, you know what I mean? Yeah, what yeah. Well, I mean, it, I mean, come on, man. In the world of 2021 <laughs> social media, you're you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. yeah. There's, so, there's no pleasing everybody. But it is. It, it, it was... I don't know the numbers on how many people have lost their title from a disqualification like that because it's None. so on. Yeah, I didn't think so. And it's so unprecedented. So I could like we were talking about earlier, these fighters, coaches, camps, they, they, they fight their asses off to get a shot at the title. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't even get it, even though they deserve it. So to see somebody win it and then floss it in such kind of dubious circumstances, I could see why he could get a lot of ire from the, mm -hmm. the MMA communities. I mean, I, I get that. But, you know, again, he got hit with an illegal knee and the rules are the rules. Totally, totally. Do you think now this raises another question? What because it was even with everything that's happened with the three events that's happened, Al Jermaine Sterling, Darren Stewart, and I can't remember who was who he was fighting again. Uh, Edwards, Leon Edwards. No, no, or no. The, His opponent, but yeah, Andy Leon and Edwards thing. Every all of those events were handled totally differently. Why isn't there, and obviously I know it's different events, it's different fighters, it's slightly different circumstances, even though two were in evil knees while on the ground, mm. and it's different judges. Why isn't there like a standard thing <clears throat> which everyone yeah. would know, okay, this guy's been kneading his head, regardless of what <laughs> happens, he's disqualified, the other person's won, or it's he, an old contest. Yeah, there should be a universal standard. There shouldn't be any kind of ambiguity in that because if there is then like 
if something happens again down the line similar where they don't lose their belt and Yan's like, whoa, I lost my belt for an illegal knee. Why isn't he? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's very important that they have a universal standard and not, you know, obviously circumstances dictate. But if you're talking about an illegal knee, you're talking about an illegal knee and mm. the result should be the same. Illegal is illegal is illegal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, especially, again, when you're going to take one guy's title from it and then you're just, well, this circumstance was a little bit different. Even though it was a knee, I don't think it deserves a full disqualification. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. See how, what we, did, how do we part and parcel that? I just know because what I did, Jeff, is I just lifted my knee up slightly. I gave him like thirty <laughs> percent. You know, I didn't give him the whole hundred. <laughs> I was trying to pick him back up with my knee. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, Jeff again had have had a wonderful uh, conversation. Um, plug all the social medias and and um, promote this um, up and coming event as well. Again, yeah, cagedaggression TV. Man, we are obviously all over the world. March twenty fifth. 26th 27th it's going to be amazing we have like three nights of just jam-packed stack cards like i said saturday night pat milicic will be calling it friday night jens paul will be calling it with me and then friday and then saturday it'll be me and jordan henman but i mean i'm so looking forward to it. we've been putting so much work into this so uh yeah please if you guys aren't doing anything around the world i know you're over there in the uk yeah mm-hmm. uh, if you want to check us out now i mean case aggression dot tv and uh, me personally, Twitter, I'm Jeffrey Wilson. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram at J. Michael Will. Just trying to do my thing, man. And I can, you know, I can't thank you enough, man. I appreciate you uh, reaching out to me every once in a while, seeing how I'm doing and getting us, uh, get me back on the show. Even though we're different, a little bit of a different subject matter this time. That's yes. all right. We got a bunch of the MMA stuff going on. So exactly. definitely wanted to talk about that. And I, I appreciate you, my man. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. Um, time wise, what time is it starting? Um, do, 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 do. I think 6.30 or 7.30 Central Standard Time um, okay. each night, March 25th, 26th, 27th. I don't know exactly what time. You guys are about six or seven hours ahead, so yeah. it will be a little bit late. But about 11, 12. You. Well, look, look, Mike, it, it, I mean, Jeff, this is nothing because we have to stop <laughs> up until 3 a.m. to watch the main events for UFC. So, you know, an early start at 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, that's even better. Well, and not to throw it out there, but whatever, just keeping it 100. Uh, that <laughs> Saturday, the 25th, 26th, the 27th will be the rematch between Francis Ngano and Stipe Miocic. So I know you might have another option for Saturday night, but uh, you can actually do both if you want to. But obviously, uh, Saturday night, we'd love to see you over at cageaggression.tv. But we are up against a little competition Saturday night. But Thursday and Friday, again, cageaggression.tv. You will not be disappointed. Definitely. And I'll make sure I put the links below in the description. Uh, make sure Please you go do. over and check it out. Um, you will not be disappointed in regards to the level of talent uh, and the production quality as well. Uh, so as I say, go and follow over onto the social medias as well and tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend to subscribe and share. <laughs> Without a doubt. Thank you so much, brother.